Hello again, my most amazing artists. Today, we're coming back to look at the work of a contemporary artist whose name is Jen Arani. You might recognize her work from this winter landscape. This is what we are going to try and create today. We have already done the steps that make up our sky. We are going to create a landscape to go underneath that watercolor painting that we created for our sky color. So let's see what those next steps are. Okay. So in order to do this, we are going to have to discuss a few things. But the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to notice that this landscape is a circle. Now, in order to make this a circle, I'm going to have to make two semicircles. One that is like an arch, like a rainbow. Okay, and notice the rainbow is in the sky, so the arch should be facing upward. Down here, I have the landscape. That's gonna be a U shape because it's underground, okay? So we are gonna remember to make our arch on our sky color and a U shape for this paper. So in order to do that, I'm gonna use this plate right here. And notice, I'm gonna push it all the way up to the top and I'll show you right here. All the way up to the top, or quite nearly, and trace around it. Notice that the yellow is what's on the bottom, okay? Because remember, the sun is setting over the mountains. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this aside, and I am going to create a U shape on this piece of paper. After I've created that U shape, I'm gonna draw what is known as a horizon line. Now, you are definitely gonna to wanna to do this with a pencil. I, however, am going to do it with a Sharpie so that I can make sure you can clearly see what it is that I am trying to show you. So, I'm gonna start by drawing a horizon line. A horizon line is where the sky and the ground meet each other. Here, I have drawn my horizon line at the widest part of my circle. It's okay if it's not a perfectly straight line. Let's talk a little bit about landscapes for a second. When we're looking at landscapes, there are a few things you might wanna notice. For instance, one thing you might see when you look out into nature is that things that are farther away from you appear smaller than they are in real life. Another thing you might notice is that things that are far away have a lot less detail. They're a little bit more hazy than things that are up close to us that we can see the detail on. Okay, and these are things that we want to pay attention to because when we go to make a landscape, we want to make sure we're following those same rules. So there are a few rules that I'm going to teach you about right now, and they make up an acronym. This acronym is BOLD, B-O-L-D. Here's how the phrase goes. If an object is closer to me in space, it is going to be bigger, overlapping, lower on the paper, and be more detailed. Okay, so you can see that in this very simple landscape that I've drawn here. Now this is just a quick sketch, but it demonstrates the same principle that you would see in real life. Okay, so if an object is closer to me, it's going to be much bigger than an object that is far away. If an object is closer to me, it's going to be overlapping. That means one object is in front of the other. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're touching. It just means that it's blocking out part of my view. For instance, this tree right here is covering the trees in the background. Okay, you see that again. Here, this tree is overlapping these mountains, and we would see this in real life if we were to look out in nature, okay? And objects that are closer to me, and now this one is not always true, but objects that are closer to me are usually lower on the paper. So if they're being affected by gravity, which means they're sitting on the ground or on a surface, they're probably going to appear lower than something that is farther away, which will maybe start on the ground a little bit higher up. Okay, they're lower on the paper and they have more detailed. Remember, objects that are closer to me are bold. They are detailed. So I'm gonna see a lot more detail in the trees that are much closer to me rather than the ones that are really far away. All that being said, we wanna make sure we're demonstrating those same principles 
when we go to draw our own landscape. So, the very first thing after my horizon line that I'm going to draw are my mountains. Now remember, I'm doing this with a Sharpie, but you are using a pencil. I'm gonna start by drawing a zigzag line. You do not wanna make zigzag lines that are too skinny or too pointy. Also, you don't have to bring them all the way back down to the ground. So here are some things that I probably wouldn't do. If this was my horizon line, I probably wouldn't just go like this, right? I also don't want like a million itty bitty mountains. That's gonna be really difficult to draw and really difficult to shade and really difficult to cut. They look more like spikes. Mountains are a little bit more organic. You don't need as many of them and they can be kind of rough edged, okay? They don't need to be perfect. So these are my mountains. You'll notice some of them come almost up to the top. Some of them drop down a little lower. Most of them do not come back and touch the horizon line, but you could if you wanted to on a few of them. Now, something I really want you to notice is that, again, this is a U shape. My mountains should be pointing towards the flat side of my paper, not the rounded side that I just made, okay? From here, what I'm gonna draw are the shadows. And the way that Janari does this is she actually makes like a wiggly line down the center of her mountain, and this does not need to be a perfect zigzag, from the tallest point of the mountain down to really any point. Tallest part of the mountain down. Tallest part of the mountain down. Again, it can be very wiggly. Does not need to be a perfect zigzag by any means. Because remember, it is organic. Now this is where it gets tricky. From the lowest point of the mountains, I'm gonna connect to that side. Now, here on this example, you'll notice there's shadows hitting one side of the mountain. That's because the sunset is probably happening over here and the sun is hitting the surface of the mat, uh, the shadow, excuse me, surface of the mountain, casting a shadow onto the opposite side. So how do we recreate that? Well, let's pretend instead that the sun is on this side this time. Okay, if the sun is shining over here, then I'm going to connect from this point at the bottom of that wiggly line that I just made up to the lowest part of the mountain on the left hand side. That's the side I'm gonna create a shadow on since the sun is on the right. It's gonna be opposite. From the lowest point over here where this wiggly line is up to the lowest point on the mountain. To the lowest point on the mountain, to the left every single time. You have to stay consistent or this won't look right. Okay, and from here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create some diagonal lines on the left-hand side in that empty section. Remembering again to do that on every one, and I'm trying to keep my diagonal lines in the same direction. They should be parallel and all kind of traveling in the same direction. Okay. And very easily you can see how I've turned something that's a very simple shape like these mountain peaks into something that looks more realistic by creating these lines. This is a technique that artists sometimes call hatching. Okay, is when we make these lines to create shadows. So, what's next? Now that I've added my mountains, I need to remember bold. Objects that are closer to me are bigger, overlapping, lower, and detailed. So as I draw my trees, I wanna keep that in my mind. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with a tree that is far away from me. I might add a tree up here. And it's super tiny because it is really far away. Maybe I'll put another one right there. And maybe I want one right around here, but that's a medium sized tree. And maybe I want a really big one right here. Okay, so I'm just getting an idea of where I would like to see these trees. And if I wanna add more when I'm done, I can't. The last thing that I might wanna add here are just some snowy banks. So maybe 
add a skinny line in the background and kind of wider line and again overlap is good right you don't have to add a whole lot to this to make it look like snow but occasionally a couple bumps might be helpful to better create that illusion <clears throat> from here i need to cut out this and this in order to do this next step okay so i'm just going to cut on that line remember as you're cutting to turn your paper not your scissors this will help you make smoother cuts and keep your fingers safe one thing that can help you when you're cutting <clears throat> this zigzag line here is if you cut in from both sides so here's what i mean i'm going to cut up this mountain and i'm going to cut in from this side stop when i get to the bottom and then cut in from this side. Stop when I get to the bottom, and that piece should just fall right out. Watch again. Cut in, stop. Cut in, stop. That can be much easier than trying to turn my scissors inside this little crevice, which can sometimes be very tricky. Okay, so again, if I cut in from both sides and stop at the very bottom of that piece, then I can cut out all of my mountains that way. Okay, so for now, I'm gonna set this aside. Please make sure all your scrap paper ends up in the trash. <clears throat> this piece does not get glued on this piece like this. That would be crazy. And I see this happen all the time. I also see students trying to glue things together like this. That also does not make any sense and it does not make a circle, okay? If you really wanna check and make sure your work is correct, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna add glue to the back of the tops of your mountains. So only on my mountains am I going to add glue. And you can see here, I'm using this purple glue so it's showing up. I'm only adding it to the back of my mountains. Stopping there and then in order to check my work, I'm going to take this plate back out. I'm going to line this, uh, this uh, sky up with it. Okay, it's lined up. I'm going to take this piece. And listen, if your yellow doesn't show up and you want it to, tilt it a little bit. Okay, there's no reason you can't do that. And then make sure your bottom is aligned just like your top. If it's off center, scoot it up a little bit. Mine was off center. We're not perfect people. It's hard to make perfect circles. Use a tool. Make your job easier. Okay? So once you have it where you want it, that's when you're going to stick it down. Now, it can be helpful to move the plate out of the way. Okay? And you get that glued on there. Now, once this is stuck together, we're still not done because we need to put it on our background. So let's get this stuff out of our way. We're going to get a black sheet of paper right here, right? And I'm going to get this piece, flip it over, <clears throat> add glue around the outside edge, a little bit in the center, flip it over, try to make sure it's centered. Is it in the middle? If it is, then give it a little massage. Gentle. Okay. And the final step is going to be to write your name at the bottom left-hand corner. Please listen to that again. Write your name in the bottom left-hand corner. In the bottom right-hand corner, you're going to put whatever your class code is. Okay? And if you follow the directions correctly, it should look just like this. I hope you've really enjoyed making these winter landscapes. I think that they can all look really unique despite the fact we're doing the same thing. They always turn out really, really lovely when you follow the directions correctly. 
Don't forget about bold perspective. Remember, things that are closer to you are bigger, overlapping, lower, and detailed. Have fun, amazing artists.